today I'll be presenting you know, some more systems and capabilities that will facilitate right, ready data for various applications. Okay? So in this particular presentation, I'll be talking a bit about, you know, for example, some of the user, you know, the user interfacing in the software, but I won't go into too much detail with that. Uh, if you're interested in more kind of the user experience using some of our different pieces of software and what the data looks like in the UIs, uh, Joe will be talking a bit more about that as well for the presentation coming up right after mine. So let me go here. So as in, you know, for the outline today, I'm going to just be starting off with introducing, um, you know, the digitalization of scientific data just in general. And then I'd like to discuss the, in particular, the digitalization of data in the HTE world, as well as in, you know, QC databasing and management of the data there. And these are just two quick examples <clears throat> of um, areas where digitalization and can be relevant and important. All right, so digitalization of data is one of the most rapidly evolving areas right, in the scientific world. So the idea of data digitalization, in fact, is not new, right? However, we can also think of you know, Excel files, right? As an example where, which is an example of digitalization, but it's a fairly primitive step in the evolution of the digitalization world, right? So many organizations, you know, as you're probably all familiar and aware, in the chemical industries have and still do use Excel files you know, and other you know, similar file formats to store data you know, that are obtained from your various sources, you know, various instruments, various ELNs, so on and so forth. So data coming from all these different sources has been you know, a major challenge for organizations to really overcome. So some examples of data sources that you may be familiar with are you know, robotic instruments and analytical instruments. So you could think of examples of robotic instruments uh, and data coming from robotic instruments are from you know, solid and liquid handling robots that are used in HTE. So you have those liquid dispensers, solid dispensing robots. There's then you have some data that's attached to those sources. Uh, you can also have, for example, uh, another Fairly common one is Mettler Toledo eye control data you know, when you're monitoring reaction progress. So if you want to monitor, you know, the temperatures, the pH levels across uh, multiple time points. Okay. So these are two examples of robotic instrument data. We also have, uh, you know, analytical data, and this is where, you know, likely the vast majority of the data actually comes from the you know, relevant data. You know, the, the analytical data can include multiple techniques, right? You can have chromatography, you know, you have all the spectral, uh, all the spectroscopies, you have, you know, mass spec, NMR, IR, any other spectroscopies you can think of that you may be collecting. And in addition to this, each technique, each of these individual techniques, right, have data that are collected from different vendor instruments and different vendor software, meaning all the raw data files are being saved in different file formats, you know, all together. And so after, you know, any, you know, after the data is collected, there's going to be processing and analysis done to the data. And then you'll need to, you know, typically generate different types of reports that, um, that contain these results. However, even in these generated reports, they can come in different file formats themselves, right? So, um, they can be saved in different file, like different directories, different locations. There can be different versioning issues that are going on. And this is what you're seeing basically being depicted on the screen here. You have all these different file formats, you have all different data coming from different sources, and you have all these different kind of targeted questions that you see on the bottom that different scientists and analytical chemists may be asking, uh, may be asking about. So it could be a challenge to get all, to pull basically all the necessary you know, desired information from all these sources. So in addition to this, these data are also coming from many different groups within the organizations itself, right? or the organization themselves, each potentially with their own set of you know, practices and rules. And in some cases, the data can also be generated externally, as in the cases of CXOs, for example. 
So the aim is basically, how can we efficiently combine and store the data from all these sources into a single location? Okay. So we are you know, actively improving our existing solutions to address this exact challenge here, right? in which all the relevant data can be stored in you know, a single enterprise database, or for example, Oracle databases, which is what this image at the center is depicting here. Instead of having all these different um, sources uh, or yeah, all the different sources and file formats that are floating around, they can all be stored in one central location for different scientists to pull the data easily. Okay. So once this data is actually normalized and stored in this one location, it becomes much easier to extract any desired information to answer you know, any targeted you know, analytical questions, the ones that you kind of see at the bottom of the screen here. Sure. So I have a slide here for where I want to define digital twins. So digital twin is a term, and this will become relevant in a few moments here why I wanted to discuss this here. So digital twin is a term that is becoming more relevant in the world of technology and digitalization. Right? So to define a digital twin, you must first define what a physical twin is. Okay? So a physical twin is very simply a real world product system or a process. Nothing too complicated. So an example of a physical twin you know, in the chemical industry you can think of is the entire you know, high throughput experimentation process, the HTE process, which involves you know, the design of the experiment, the execution of the experiment, and the, the analysis and the report generation. Another example is the collection and storage of analytical QC data right, of any purified compounds that you may be studying. Okay, so these are physical twins. Now, a digital twin is simply a digital model of a physical twin. Okay? So this serves as a digital counterpart of it for practical purposes, such as you know, monitoring, integration, and simulation uh, applications. Okay. So basically, digital twins deliver the, or the advantage, right? You can think of the advantage of di digital twins is they deliver the ability to understand and make data-driven decisions right, much easier. You know, it can filter from millions of existing data points, and you may be able to simulate varying scenarios you know, in their systems using different models that you can try to generate. And this was uh, described just you know, previously by uh, Jay as well. You heard them talking about using these models and trying to simulate different you know, results and conditions. So the reason why I'm, I am describing these digital twins is because many of our products and solutions right, can be thought of as digital twins, which you'll be able to see shortly in my coming slides. Okay. All right. So th there's, a lot on the there's a lot of text on the screen here. Don't need to necessarily go into these in a lot of detail right now. But what I just want to highlight with this particular slide is you know ask the question you know, what are the general steps in which digital twins are created and utilized so again i'll go into into these in much detail but generally you could think of the following you know main grouping of steps so you'll have initially the real-time uh, capture of analytical data so that'll be coming from the instruments then once it's actually captured and collected you'll have the marshalling, you have the organization and the storage of the data in an enterprise database. And then finally, once it's actually stored in the database, you can have the conversion of the data to machine learning friendly formats, for example, to be used as training data for models and simulations. Okay. So collect the data, you store and analyze the data in one location, and then you can export those results for use in models as an example. So simulation models can be very useful in the pharmaceutical R&D world, right? And this, this is achievable though, if the digital twins are crafted though with you know, certain level of care and they contain enough you know, good data, good information that you can use from. So for example, 
you may want to create models to simulate a compound stability, and as you can see here, over different, you know, for example, degradation conditions. You may want to, you know, generate models for lead optimization performances. You may want to develop models for development, you know, candidate selections. Again, I'm not going to go into detail with, you know, these simulation models here on the screen, but what you see on the slide are just a few examples, right, of some models in, you know, in the discovery and the development world, as an example. And this is by no means a, you know, a comprehensive list of different models. These are just some relevant ones that could be of interest and why, you know, the digitalization of data can be or is important. Rather. Okay. So next, I'd like to finally get into some real examples of digitalization of scientific data, starting with you know, high throughput experimentation processes here. So there are two main aspects, right? Do you, you know, I'll, I'll kind of group these two aspects in the HD processes. You have reaction design and you have the analytical results. You have these two kind of pieces that each contain their individual you know, data points. So the reaction design, and, and you, you've kind of seen this as well with uh, Christine's presentation just before this, but I will just go over this uh, again and uh, talk about some few additional things here. So when the reaction design you know, aspect, this includes you know, the materials. So you know, what are the chemical structures? What are different you know, phys chem properties? And if you have for tox or admin related properties that are relevant, you can have that type of information that you need to track. Okay. We have different critical process parameters. So these could include you know, different operations like temperatures, you know, stir rates, what are the amounts of the materials that you're inputting into the wells? Okay. And then you can have also sampling times. So if you're running any kinetic type of experiments, this is another factor that is quite important to keep track of, the actual uh, sampling times. So then when it comes to the, an the analytical results, this is fairly self-explanatory. You know, for the most part, there's LCUVMS data that's collected, you know, typically UPLC, um, for the general analysis of the of the reaction success. You can think about it. However, you may also see, you know, other type type of spectroscopies like NMR. You may also be want to collect, you know, solubility data, diffraction data, so on and so forth. Right? Any data you can think of that's relevant for your types of experiments that you're running. So Catalyst is essentially a chemically intelligent system okay, that relates these two aspects, the reaction design and the analytical results um, to each other. So being able to maintain this relationship between them is what's essentially required, right? To build effective digital models. If you want to use them for these machine learning or AI simulations and applications in the HTE world. So when setting up you know, throughput experiments, uh, you must first consider reaction design, right? So in this case, users have the ability to add materials in the reaction scheme in a variety of ways. You, know, you can import materials via SDF or CSV files. You know, in the case of MSD files, they can either be simple default SDFs, or you can actually have you know, fairly complex custom formatted SDFs, which can be parsed with you know, particular logic. So another one that I want to also emphasize here is that, you know, if organizations already have in-house databases that they've built and curate, and they currently curate, right, we're able to use API connections to, you know, to connect to these databases and pull the necessary data from them into the Catalyst experiment. Okay. So, you know, for each structures in these experiments, there may be associated metadata that's important to track you know, when it comes to the analysis of the final result at the end. For example, if you have any tox properties, if you have any lot information, those types of data, which for example, can be coming from the in-house databases that our API could connect to. Okay. So these, all these different pieces of metadata can be easily brought into Catalyst for analysis. So finally, or the next step is we have HTE setup. So the high throughput experimentation, uh, I'm not 
again, Christine described a lot of this in a bit of detail before, so I'm not going to you know, belay their point too much here. But after the reaction design comes from the actual experiment setup. So factors at this stage can include you know, the number of plates that you want to use, the amount of materials, the addition of materials to well locations, and you know, varied arrayed patterns that's necessary. And you have different aspirate dispense patterns you know, between the plates. And then finally, you have other important variables here uh, to track which are, you know, what kinds of operations are being applied to the reaction wells. For example, what's the temperature? What's the stir rate? Is there UV irradiation being applied? So what are the sampling times for the kinetics? So at this point, once the user defines and creates the experiment and catalyst, they execute the experiment via robot instruments, right? To actually dispense the materials into the plates, and then the data will be collected um, using their analytical instruments okay, once the reactions are complete. So I have a slide here that is just depicting what data visualization could look like in Catalyst. Again, uh, you've seen a bit of this with the, the previous presentation, uh, but before. I don't really want to talk about the visualization aspect too much about this, uh, about, you know, in this particular presentation. Uh, what I do want to talk about, or at least emphasize at this point is, uh, the Catalyst system is configured, right, to automatically scan, you know, for raw data files in specified directories. Okay. So once the actual analytical data is, had, you know, has been collected by the user, Catalyst will, you know, in an automated fashion, it'll scan the new data files, it will apply, you know, configurable processing settings, for you know, the peak integration, for compound assignment, and then it'll attach the process data to the experiments. Okay. Then once, you know, once the actual data are attached, you can visualize them in different ways in the, you know, in the interface. Yeah. So at this point in the process, we have collected both reaction data and analytical data uh, from the experiment. In this screenshot, we can see a table that's generated directly in the UI. And the importance for this uh, that I want to you know, showcase here is that you can have a table here that contains both the reaction data and the analytical results that are stored together. So you can see in the table on the kind of left-hand side of the table, you have columns that contain the molar amounts of materials. You have the actual temperature as well that's displayed, just as examples that are displayed in this particular table that I'm showcasing. And in the analytical data section on the right-hand side, you can see that there are different peak area percent values for some of the different compounds in, your, in the wells, in the experiment. So this just makes it very easy to visualize the relations between them, between the reaction data and the analytical data. So one major benefit though, from the digitalization of HTE processes, right, is that there is essentially no manual data transcription involved right, in the whole process here. Right. To summarize the whole process, you know, using Catalyst, the user will create the experiment design in the Catalyst UI. They will generate robot instrument uh, instruction lists, right, to import into the robots. At the same time, they'll also generate analytical sequence files uh, for the actual data collection. And then once the data has been collected, like I mentioned before, the data will automatically be scanned and attached to your experiments. Right? So because of this. You know, the sources for potential human error are drastically minimized. These are the very minimal human transcription. Okay. An important point here to emphasize is that all these data and relations are stored in an Oracle database. Okay. So which makes it much makes it a much simpler matter, right? To export the selected results into desired file formats, you know, like JSON, XML, CSV files for any further downstream use. Some areas of this use can include you know, visualization in data analytics software. So for example, like Spotfire, you can have you know, analysis in, statistic, uh, in different statistical softwares like Jump or Tableau, right? And you can have, um, you know, it has its use in also data science applications like for machine learning AI you know, models for simulations. All right, 
So in the next, uh, for the rest of the presentation, I'll just uh, briefly describe some of our solutions and processes where the goal is to organize and store analytical data, right? Into custom built databases, right? In an automated fashion. So in this workflow, we start off with a collection of raw analytical data, right? It can be LCMS, NMR, doesn't matter what it is. And in addition to this, you may also have ELNs or in-house libraries that also contain important sample information that you may want to track. So Spectrus Conduit is one of our newly developed applications that we've, you know, that we've developed that connects, designs, and manages any automated data flows, basically starting from the analytical instruments and other, you know, other, other sources of data. So at a high level, you're basically able to create automated workflows which will actively scan the raw data files. So this is what these kind of gears represent here. You can apply any set of processing actions. So there are different actions in here, which I'll go into in a bit more detail in the next slide. And then you can store the process data in you know, a specified enterprise database for you know, any type of processing or any exporting applications after, as I just described before. So in the Spectrus Conduit interface, users are able to define the steps in the data flows in a no-code, low-code manner. So the workflow library on the left-hand side here um, is a list of all automated data flows that have been created by the users. So you can see here, um, each workflow represents a unique set of processing operations. And again, I'll clarify this in a second here. So for example, on the left-hand side, you see there are three workflows here one workflow for 1D NMR processing, one for 2D NMR processing, and one for, for example, LCUVMS data processing. At the center of the screen, you have this library of operations here, uh, which is a list of all actions that you may want to apply to the data. Okay. And then finally, the main piece is on the right-hand side, which contains um, a list of cards that correspond to the actions that belong to the selected workflow. So in this case, you see the LCU VMS workflow is selected. So in this screenshot that we're looking at here, for example, the following actions are all being applied to the LCU VMS data. So in the first part here, uh, it's a bit cut off, but this is scanning the raw LCMS data from a specified directory. Then you have the next card that defines the processing steps of the raw data. So, you know, for example, what are the peak picking settings? What are the peak integration, you know, compound assignment settings? All those can be stored in here. Then you have the next, oops, sorry, I went up the slide by accident. Then you have uh, the store to database here card, which will store the process data into, again, the specified database. And then you have this reporting and exporting tools, which will generate, you know, PDF or CSV reports. And you can also export, you know, the data to JSON files. Okay. So the reason why we've created Spectrus Conduit, right, is that we want to help organizations control the flow of their own you know, instrument generated data. But at the same time, also give them flexibility to adapt, you know, such controls without relying on, you know, extensive configuration and customization services. Okay. So we're really putting it in the hands of you, the users. So I just have here a very quick short video on what Spectrus Conduit looks like. You know, again, I don't want to go into too much detail here, but you can see the way it works is when you select a workflow, you can add these different cards to the right-hand side. You simply just need to enter the necessary information for each card. So in this case, we're entering information on um, you know, the scanned directories and the different settings um, related to the scanning of the data and the sweeping of the data, as you can see. And then you can create different cards here by just, just double clicking on, you know, the cards that you see in the middle, in the center section, in the actions. Okay? So this is kind of, I just wanted to show this quick video just to demonstrate what it kind of looks like in the UI here, what the user experience could look like. Okay. And finally, the data that's now stored in the database can be viewed in an online interface as seen here. Again, I'm not gonna go delve too much into the visualization of this data here, but I will just, I just want to emphasize here that in the screenshot, you can see that this record that I've opened here 
contains various pieces of information about a sample. So you have structural information and different, you know, for example, physchem properties related to the structure. You have different, you know, chromatographic data. You have spectral data, like NMR, for example, and you have different processing results that can be viewed as well at the same time, right? All in one place. So similar to how I described in, you know, at the end of the HTE section um, from my, you know, just a few minutes ago, the data, since the data is now stored all in one location, all database, it now becomes normalized and standardized in this format. So the results can again be easily exported, uh, you know, for machine learning purposes and AI purposes for applications. Okay. So I like to now just summarize the, you know, what we've talked about here. So ACD Labs, you know, offers a variety of technologies, right, that will help you, you know, in your journey to digitalization, uh, digitalizing, sorry, your laboratory workflows, right, and to make experimental data available for all, you know, secondary and, you know, downstream data science uses. So I covered this with examples of HDE and data management for QC purposes here. So our expertise has always been in scientific workflow support, right, through applications and capabilities that help scientists, you know, make confident decisions from their data. So through our, you know, vendor agnostic and multi-technique platform here, the data is seamlessly, seamlessly prepared for both human and machine use, whatever the desired output is or outcome is. And then finally, I want to just end the presentation with saying, you know, automation is really the key to digitalization of laboratory per, uh, you know, processes. For many decades, we've supported our clients. We've worked with automating, you know, complex workflows for them. Uh, we now also offer an application here, so Spectrus Conduit, that, where you can use, you know, to automate your own workflows yourselves, you know, putting the power into the hands, your hands, right, of those that are intimately familiar right, with your processes and any needs of your particular organizations. With that, I'd like to thank you for uh, listening to the presentation. I'll take any questions.